Hey everybody, welcome to another Insight Ministries podcast. I am joined by my good friend Brandon Thomas. Several of you who have followed us for a while now uh, might remember that we've done a couple episodes together. Uh, I think our last one was on Revelation 5, which is such a good conversation that we had. So if you haven't uh, caught up that episode, scroll back on our YouTube page or in our podcast list and check it out. But tonight, fresh topic, Um, we're going to talk about the subject of favor. Uh, and what it means in context, biblically, what kinds of favor there are, things like that. Um, but I just want to welcome you uh, to the to the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's always a blast to do this. Love to sit around and open up the scriptures, to be with a good friend, and to uh, dive into the Word and to see what the Lord has to say for us. Yeah, absolutely. So Brandon preached a message uh, at Church of the Living God not too long ago about this topic of favor. Um, and he preached mostly out of Genesis 18, so that's one of the, the references we're going to hit uh, in this episode. But um, what kind of went into that message? Like maybe tell us how did the Lord download that to you, and was that part of the plan and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so great question. Uh, originally, uh, I was all set uh, on a message for that Sunday Um I had a message fully prepared, fully baked, and ready to go. Uh, I was not looking for a message, um, but the Lord had other plans, as He often does, and uh, as I like to say, He's still the boss. So uh, when I was in prayer that morning, um, the Lord um, really started to prick my heart about this idea of hunger and this idea of um, becoming comfortable in this place where we're at and in this place of of, um, familiarity. And I I was reminded of Abraham in Genesis 18, where he's in a place where he's met with God often. He's heard from God often, and he sees the Lord walking by. He's sitting at the door of his tent in this posture of expectation, kind of prophetically. And when he sees the Lord, he gets up and he takes off sprinting to the Lord. And he cries out with this, this wild request, please, Lord, if I have favor in your sight, don't pass me by. And um, I, preparing the message, there wasn't a ton of um, insight or thought going into the the idea of favor. But as we got into the favor, the Lord really honed in on that topic. And we spent a good amount of time there during the message about this idea of what it looks like to have favor with the Lord. Um, I think in in Christian circles, we, we often maybe miscategorize favor. Um, we would maybe look at the topic of favor and say you either have favor or you don't have favor. But biblically, there are really two camps for favor. In Proverbs, the, the scripture tells us that there is favor with man, but there's also favor with God. And those two things look vastly different. They do. And, and so the angle that you took in your sermon was, was more aligned with what favor with God looks like. But I think we as Christians are far more familiar with what favor with man looks like. You know, for instance, um, you might have somebody come to you and say, hey, will you pray for me that I have favor at my job or favor with my boss for a a raise? Um, You know, and we've talked about this. Sometimes you're you're driving around and even looking for a parking spot. You get a spot right at the front door and you're like, hey, I've got favor. Right? Won't he do it? Yeah, that's right. And so I think we as Christians get very comfortable with the topic of favor. Right. And oftentimes when we're praying for favor, we're praying for an outcome. Right. Something to change, something to be gifted to us, that kind of favor. But that's that's not the same type of favor uh, that we see in Genesis 18. And so kind of break down for us uh, the difference. You said that it lives in two camps, really, favor with man, as Proverbs says, and favor with God. So contrast those two for us. Sure. The way I like to think about it is favor with man looks like open doors, opportunities, um, open blessings. If you want whatever whatever uh, title you want to use there, it's, it's an opening with man. Hmm. The favor of man is an opening, a provision with man. So when I'm asking the Lord for favor with man in my job or favor with man in a business deal or favor with man um, when I'm stuck in traffic and I've got to get to my kids' practice, it, as silly as it may seem, 
um, the scripture does say he cares about the things that concern right. us. Right. Um, it may seem silly, but that favor is is favor with man that opens doors with man. Right. And so when you're you're right, we're we're very familiar with those because the results are naturally tangible. When I ask for favor with man and the result is a raise at work, I, I can point to that very easily and go, I prayed for favor, favor came, and this was the result. But favor with God does not look like that. Mm. Favor with God, if if favor with man looks like open opportunities with man, then favor with God looks like open opportunities with God. Mm. And so in Genesis 18, Abraham is is met by the Lord himself. 18 Genesis 18:1 says the Lord came to visit Abraham. The Lord comes walking by Abraham's tent and the and Abraham says to the Lord, "If I have found favor in your sight, please don't go." And I was reminded God has two best friends in the Old Testament. Mm. David is obviously a man after God's own heart, but two people are called God's best friends in the Old Testament, Abraham and Moses. Right. And both are said to have tested, if we can use that terminology, the favor that they have with the Lord. And in both instances, in Genesis 18 and in Exodus 33, the friends of God test their favor with God and they test it by saying, if I actually have favor with you, it will look like you coming close and you staying close to me. Right. Exodus 33, Moses is being shown the path forward. Uh, they've come out of Egypt. They're being shown the path into the promised land. And he says, if your presence, he says it to the Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, then we're not going to go. Like we're not going to get up from here and go without your presence. And and that tells us that um, some people would say, well, the promised land was their measure of favor. They were being gifted a land flowing with milk and honey. And so that promised land was favor with God. But Moses said, I don't care what land it is. If you're not there, I don't want it. Abraham does the same thing. So Genesis 15, Abraham's remind given this promise this great promise that he and his descendants are going to be blessed for forever at the place where he meets God in Genesis 18 the very same place Genesis 17 he's given in the cov he's given the covenant of circumcision and reminded that hey I'm still going to bless you and I'm going to be for you at the very same place that he meets God in Genesis 18 mm -hmm. and in Genesis 18 he's meeting God again at this familiar place holding this promise that he received in this very same location. And rather than saying, hey, God, if I have favor with you, remember what you spoke to me 24 years ago at this exact spot when you promised me right. that you would give me a son, I'd be a father of many nations, that my descendants would be greater than the sand of all the seashores and greater than the stars of the heavens. But but Abraham, does, Abraham doesn't say that. Abraham says, if I have favor with you, you stay with me. Right. And he he goes on and he matter of fact, he says, and and in fact, if you'll stay with me, I'll give you something. Right. I'll I'll provide you an offering is what he goes on to give the Lord. Yeah. He goes on to give the Lord an offering that in the original Hebrew would sustain the heart of mm. the Lord. He ministers to the heart of the Lord. And he says, if you'll stay with me, I'll minister to your heart. I love that. You said in your message. You said, um, you know, we, we invite the Lord to stay. You know, Abraham says, don't pass me by. And when the Lord comes near to us, how are we going to sustain his staying near to us? And, and, you know, it's what you're saying. It's an offering before the Lord. It's, it's worship. It's, it's having him show up and not change the subject. But when you beg him to stay and he comes close, then you sustain him with what you bring him, not with what he's going to give you. Yeah, it's easy to cry out, God, please don't go, or God, come into the room, or Lord, we want you to come and have your way. And then when he comes in, say, Lord, you can do whatever you want. Stay and have your way. It, it's more difficult when the Lord says, okay, and then what do you do next? Right. He's actually looking for someone who will actually minister to him. Uh, the scripture says in Genesis 18 that that Abraham um, would would bring an offering to the Lord that he would that he would bring a meal before the Lord that that the Lord could feast on that the Lord went and reclined under a tree. Right. The Lord of glory reclines under a tree and and Abraham ministers to his heart. He even washes his feet, which is a it's a picture of what we see the the woman do 
doing in Luke 7 with yeah. the who brings the alabaster box. And so it's it's this picture of worship, right? Right. Abraham worships the Lord, recognizing that it's not enough to just say, I want you to stay. I've actually got to give you something and provide you something in this moment. Now, you brought up a, a, a very interesting point. Um, you said that that this story in Genesis 18, it occurs at a familiar place. And you, you hit on this in your, in your sermon, but this idea that when God comes and visits a familiar place, because it's familiar to us, we actually have a greater chance of uh, missing that opportunity, missing that encounter. Because when we're familiar with something and we're comfortable, we oftentimes can get kind of complacent. Sure. And and therefore, um, when an opportunity comes, sometimes we let the opportunity pass us by because we're too busy being comfortable in what we've already received. So Famili- talk, yeah, talk about familiarity and how that can actually really kill <laughs> that opportunity of favor with God. It can. And you it, just think about it anecdotally for a moment. If you've ever gone to a church conference or you've ever been invited to a revival service that's maybe outside of your church or outside of your typical setting, there is an, um, there is an excitement and electricity, a, an anticipation and expectation in the air. You don't walk into the room with a routine or a schedule or a program, Mm. but when you're home, um, whether that be your church home or your natural home or whatever that may look like for you, familiarity begins to set in and it is a constant battle to fight against this comfort that comes with familiarity. You know, the Christian is called to live, um, not comfortable, right? We're not called to live comfortable. And, and pastor Bill Johnson says that the sacrifice and comfort are just one step apart from each other. Wow. And so what I offer as a sacrifice today will quickly become comfort and convenience tomorrow. Wow. And so I have to constantly in my walk with Jesus fight against this this temptation and this persuasion to become comfortable and relaxed because the 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 idea is well I've met him here before, I've done this before, I was I was with the Lord here yesterday or I've I've already had my encounter with the Lord. I've already got my tears out for right. the week. I've I've already got my good cry out. And and, um, if the Lord is coming by the tent, so to speak, if the Lord is showing up, it's not, it's not for no purpose. He's coming by for a reason. And it, and it requires a hungry heart to recognize that he's come by to look up and take notice of him and to run to his feet. Right. Abraham ran to his feet and bowed down and said, please don't go. Yeah. And, and I think the caution here is when you experience a measure of favor with the Lord, you cannot let that become routine or else before you know it, the Lord might have passed you by and you not even realize it. Sure. And what's scary is, is the presence of Almighty God can become commonplace. Mm. He becomes commonplace. Goodness. We often, and many people have preached it, so I don't have a good person to quote for this, but many people have have talked about the idea that one day we'll get to glory and we'll look at the saints of old and we'll say, David, what was it like to go into the tent? Or Moses, what was it like to meet him on the mountain? Or, you know, Abraham, what was it like to to sit under the tree with him and minister to his heart? Only for the old saints to turn to us and say, what was it like to have the living God living on the inside of you? Right. And, and it is a sobering thought to be reminded that when he shows up in a tangible manifest way, it is, it is still a holy thing. Yeah. It's still a glorious thing. No matter if I've experienced it one time or one million times and to treat that experience as commonplace, it is a dangerous deception of the enemy. And um, he obviously, the enemy obviously works to remove us from the presence of the Lord. But if he can't convince you to get out of the presence of the Lord, he'll convince you to get so close that you treat it as commonplace. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know, that's such a good point because no matter how close the Lord's presence came in the Old Testament, you know, like you said, with with Abraham under the tree or with Moses on the mountain, David in the tent, no matter how close the presence of God got, 
it's never been as close as the indwelling of the spirit of God living within us. And, and you're right. Like it's easy to look at the old Testament and go, I want those paramount encounters, but yet how much do those saints long to know what it was like to have the spirit living on the inside of them? The flesh and blood Christ says to his apostles, I've, I've got to go Yeah, because it's better it's for, for you your good, right? that I would go so that he can come. Right. And yeah. we cannot allow ourselves to treat it as common when he walks into a room. He is everywhere. Right. But the God, as again, Bill Johnson likes to say, the God who is everywhere wants to make himself known somewhere. Right. And when he walks into a room, it's for a reason. Right. And we can't allow that to become common. So this idea of the two different favors, favor with God and man, we see that in Proverbs, but we also see it played out in the life of Christ. In Luke chapter 2, it tells us that Jesus grew in favor with God and with man. Now that gets kind of tricky because you're like, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was God. Well, he is. Yeah. And, and he, he is 100% God and he's 100% man. And as he's walking on the earth, he's still growing in favor with the Father and favor with, you know, the people around him. What does that look like in the life of Christ? It's wild, right? Like, why does Christ, the eternal God, have to grow in favor? Uh, it's it's one of those topics that um, on the surface doesn't seem to make sense. In the same way that he learned obedience. Right. The perfect one. How did he need to learn obedience? He was perfect in every way. But it was part of his human experience. Yeah. He was 100% God and yet 100% man. It is right. the most bizarre, divine, beautiful thing in all of creation. And as a part of his human experience, he submitted to growing in favor and obedience right. with the Father and can conveniently favor and obedience are tied together. Right. We see we see that the friends of God in the Old Testament are those who say, I think I have favor with you. And if I actually have favor with you, it'll look like you coming near and being with me and us being together. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus is growing in favor. He's growing in favor with God and with man. And I, I believe that growing in favor with God looks like growing in obedience to God. Mm. As we as we grow in our yes to the Lord, then we grow in our favor with God. And I, I, I think often in, in Christianity and in our circles, we would say you either have the favor of the Lord or you don't have the favor of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, that person has the favor of the Lord. And, and it, we all have equal access. Mm. Some of us have just said yes more often. Right. Some people have just said yes more often. And saying yes more often positions us as friends of God, according right. to Jesus in John 15. Right. He said, I, if you do what I tell you, I'm calling you friend. Right. And, 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 he, and he also says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Therefore, right. we see obedience. And as we grow in that obedience and we grow in friendship, we grow in proximity and closeness to the Lord. Not, not, in, not, in, um, not in doctrinal stance or theological stance, but in an experiential stance. Mm. And in experiences, we are we are positioning ourselves experientially to come closer to the Lord because we've said yes to doing what he's asked us to do. Right. And positioning ourselves to be in the favor of the Lord. So let me ask you this from a from a standpoint of growing in favor with the Lord and what that looks like. We know that, um, you know, sort of to contrast it. We talked about favor with man is sometimes receiving things. Um, but we can get tripped up when we try to apply that to favor with God because when we're praying for something and we don't see the answer that we're praying for right away or whatnot, it'll actually skew our perception of favor with God. So what does it look like and how is that a trap that we need to be aware of in that if I'm praying for something and I receive the answer to prayer, I can trick myself into thinking, oh, I've got favor with God. And the next thing I pray for, I don't get the answer right away. And I think I've fallen out of favor with God. You know, how do we, um, how do we combat that? Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a certainly a dangerous trap. And um, does, does favor with the Father sometimes position us for answer to prayers? I, I think the answer to that is certainly it can. It can. But answers to prayers don't come because of my righteousness. Mm. I don't pray in Brandon's name ever. 
Right. Not once have I ever ever said, Father, do you remember how good I was yesterday? <laughs> right. I did it really well yesterday. And in fact, I hugged that person who smelled terrible. <laughs> and so you you should remember that and show favor to me and grant my request. My prayers are always in Jesus's name. Yeah. My prayers are based upon his righteousness, his finished work, his goodness, his perfect positioning with the Father. And I've got to rest in if he says yes or if he says no, I'm resting in his perfect provision as a perfect father. Yeah. And so that is separate from separate from my favor with him because my favor with him, the reward of my favor with the father is actually intimacy with the father. That's so good. And so, so I, I think we've got to change our perspective on our reward. Yes. We've got to change our perspective on our reward. Uh, Jesus tells lots of parables throughout the new Testament, but he talks about a treasure. A man finds a treasure. The treasure is not the kingdom. The treasure is the king of the kingdom. Mm. There is one pearl of great price. Mm. It is the king at the middle of the kingdom. There are not angels singing, holy is the kingdom. Mm -hmm. They're singing to the king who sits on the throne in the midst of the kingdom. Right. And so the great prize, the great treasure, the great jewel for the believer is the king himself. Yes. Isaiah said, you're married to your maker. Right. Right. He's your husband. Yes. Don't you know? John the Baptist says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. That's right. So the great, the great reward for the believer is not he heard me and he answered me. That is the fruit, Jesus says in John 15, of being in relationship with the vine. The right. great reward of the believer is I'm attached to the vine. Yeah. That's so good. He, he is, having him, he is the favor with the Lord. Uh, it is... His presence coming close. It's that intimate relationship, like you said, intimacy with Him that is actually the measurement of favor. Yeah. It's not how blessed I am or if I get the healing I'm praying for. That reward system cannot be the measurement we chase to know if we have favor with the Lord. It's why Paul says in Philippians 3, everything, everything that I have done, I count as lost. Yeah. And more than that, what's more than all that I have done? Everything I am doing yeah. or will do. Or will do. So everything I have done, I am doing, or I will do. I count it all as lost right. for the sake of knowing him, yeah. that I may know him. He is the great treasure. Yeah. He is the great reward. And pa Paul would Paul would echo this time and time and time and time again. We, we like to quote Paul, I can do all things through him. Who's Paul would say that from a prison from a jail cell because he had found if I have him, nothing else matters. That's right. Nothing else matters. Yeah. So let me ask you this and we'll kind of wrap up, but we've talked about understanding the difference between favor with man, favor with, uh, favor with the Lord and how he is that prize. Now for those who are listening or watching this podcast, what are some practical steps to grow in favor with the Lord, knowing that what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to hand you a routine or a pattern and say, if you follow these steps, you're going to, you're going to get uh, more of the Lord's presence. But I do think that there might be people listening saying, okay, I want to grow in favor with the Lord. I want more of his presence in my relationship with him. Can you give us some practical guidance on what that looks like? Yeah, I, I think, First Thessalonians 5, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Hmm. And often we get hung up on, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not sure what God's will is for my life. If right. I knew what God wanted me to do, I would do it. If I knew the direction that God had for me, I'd pursue it. If I knew the things that God wanted me to chase after, I'd chase after them. And to a degree, that is true. There, there are specific things that God has for our life. But there's a lot in here mm -hmm. that God has for your life. Paul writes plainly to the church at Thessalonica, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Mm. This is the will of God. What does that look like practically? Well, it looks like, how do I rejoice always? Not in my flesh. Right. I've got to be rejoicing always by finding Him in every circumstance. Finding him in every moment, whether it's on a mountaintop, I've got to find his feet. Whether it's in a valley, I've got to find him as a foundation. 
How do I pray without ceasing? I've got to continually be turning my affection and my attention back to him. Right. How do I give thanks in everything? I'm I'm reminded through the scriptures of who he has been. Yes. I'm reminded, yeah, maybe my life doesn't look great right now, but according to this, he is unchanging. He has never changed and he never will change. So I dig through the scriptures and I give thanks because Maybe it doesn't look like I'm going to be rescued right now, but but the scripture says he's the one who comes and rescues me. He's the, yeah. the scripture says he's my redeemer. The scripture says he's my savior. And so I, I give my affection to the places where I know I can give my affection. Yeah. I may not know everything to do, but I do know some things to do. Right. I can find him in his word. I can find him in prayer. And then I just I do everything I can to give my attention to him at every moment that I can. Right. And then like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, when he shows up and he's revealing himself in the scriptures, then at that moment where you are lingering and you start to feel that he's moving, you just beg him to stay. Yeah, and it's it's as simple as opening this book. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to testify of me. So I open the book and I say, Holy Spirit, Jesus said you would tell me about him. So show me him. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm reading in Lamentations today. I don't know that I can find you in there, but the Holy Spirit, Jesus said you were going to show me yeah. him when you come. And I find him hidden in the passages of the Old Testament in Jeremiah where it feels like there's death and destruction and chaos. And all of a sudden my heart begins to rejoice because for thousands upon thousands of years you've been writing this story where you've been hiding yourself in the pages of history so that one day I could experience you and find you and know about you and I give myself to him as best I know how yeah and I'm gonna mess it up but I just do the best I can to give myself over and I think what we find is time and time again he honors that pursuit of our heart and he does stay and we do get him and that is favor with the Lord I take great comfort in knowing that he knows that we are but dust. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, will you will you maybe close us out by praying for anybody listening or watching this episode? Will you just pray that we would have that that holy hunger to pursue favor with God and favor with man and um and just really engage with his presence in a new and fresh way. Yeah, absolutely. Father, we we love you, and Jesus, we, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Lord, you've been so good to us. We thank you for your presence here today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and that you have revealed yourself to us through the pages of your word. Lord, we thank you for the understanding that you are the great prize that you are our great reward. Lord, that the things of this life are not our reward, but you, Jesus, are our reward. You're, you're a good father, and you often pile on extras for your children, but you, Jesus, are the primary pursuit of our hearts. And Lord, I just ask today for those who may be listening or watching that if there are hard places, calloused places, even dead places of our hearts, Lord, that have said, you know, I, I, I don't know that the Lord is my primary pursuit. I don't know that Jesus is my primary reward. I, I love him. I cherish him and I care for him, but I've turned my affections to other things and I've, I've turned my heart. Maybe, maybe, Lord, it's promises that you've given. And we've held so tightly to the promises that you've given that we fell in love with the promise more than the one who's given the promise, more than the promiser. And Lord, I just pray that we would have eyes that would turn back to you. Holy Spirit, that you would give a grace that we would turn our affections back to Jesus, that we would fall back in love with Jesus. This is the first and great commandment, that we would love the Lord with all that we are, that all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength would be given over to loving Jesus. And that the lie that says falling in love with Jesus is to abandon some other greater desire or some other greater prize, that that lie would die, that that lie would be burned up. And Lord, as we turn our affections to you, I pray that you would draw near to your people. You cannot help but draw near to us when we come and draw near to you. And so, Lord, I pray for that grace for this people, 
that as our affections turn to you, that you would come running to them, Lord, that even this week that they would experience you in a fresh and a new way, that you would give them that bread of life and a drink from that fountain of life. We pray it in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, it's always a, a fun time to sit around and Absolutely. discuss the scriptures with you. Um, if you're interested um, in the original sermon that Brandon preached, uh, you can find it uh, on Church of the Living God's podcast, and the sermon was called Lord, Please Stay. Lord, Please Stay. We'll also try to link it in the description of this episode below. But thanks for checking out this episode. We pray that it's blessed you, and uh, we pray that uh, you'll share it with others. And until next time, God bless.